And good evening and welcome once again. Welcome back to Wednesday night, our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, here in the heartland of Georgia at Calvary Chapel Heartland. Um, just what a, a blessing to be back, to be here this evening. And um, we're going to continue our study in the book of Judges tonight. So if you've been with us uh, over the past few weeks, you know, we just started the new book of uh, this new book, the book of Judges. Uh, two or three weeks ago, and um, so far, uh, we've just kind of done the first couple of chapters is more or less a summary of all that's going to take place over the next couple hundred years, two or three hundred years in the life of the Israelites, and uh, tonight we're going to kind of begin in chapter three where we, we see them, now we get more detail into the individual judges as we go along. But before we begin tonight's study. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your word. Thank you for uh, the men and women who come out diligently every week, Lord, to grow closer to you. Thank you for those watching online because they want to hear from you. Uh, Their dedication, their commitment. I pray, Lord, that you speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Speak directly into our hearts. Fill us with your spirit. Give us insight into the message you would have us to learn uh, through your word. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Fill this place now and bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So as I just mentioned, as as we finished up last week in chapter two, um, we we were kind of given this summary of of the overall book of Judges of how the Lord is going to deal with the Israelites over this next uh, th- really three hundred plus years, um, and and what he's going to you know it, it's how they're they're going to be following God at one moment, and then. They're going to turn away from God. Then God's going to deliver them over to be oppressed by their enemies because they've turned from him. And then they're, while being oppressed from, by their enemies, you know, they're going to, they're going to realize that they need God and they're going to turn back to God or they're going to cry out to God. And then he's going to hear their cries. And then because he is, full of grace and because he loves them he's going to answer those cries he's going to raise up a judge to deliver them out from being oppressed this heroic leader to lead them out from oppression and then once they've come out of oppression and things start going well again in the land they're going to fall right back into that same trap and then they're going to turn from God again. And it's all because they did not completely remove all the Canaanite people from the very beginning, from the start. They allowed these peoples to stay and their gods and their idols and they became a trap to them. And we're going to see this cycle play out over and over and over again. And chapter 2 kind of summarizes how God's going to allow that to play out through the course of this period of history. But now after that, then beginning here in chapter 3, we start to be, to see uh, a more um, detailed look at the individual judges and, and the different periods of time and how long they lasted and who the oppressors were. And so that's where we're going to begin tonight, where we pick up. So open up your Bibles and get ready. We're going to begin in chapter 3 of Judges, beginning with verse 1. God's Word reads, And now these are the nations which the Lord left, that He might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan, This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. So the first thing we notice right off the bat here is it was God says that God left the Canaanite nations behind. 
the Israelites at the time under Joshua, they had failed to be completely obedient to God. And because of their failure to be obedient, God allowed them now to stay. He says, well, if you're not going to do your part, then I'm not going to push them out before you. He said, as long as you're obedient and follow me, I'll push them out for you. But you failed to be obedient and following me, so I'm not going to push them out for you. So he allowed them to stay. And so it was really a combination of their bad choice and God's will. And he left them so that he says here that he might test Israel by them. Because he certainly had the power to completely eliminate all these pagan nations. But now he's going to use them as a test. You failed to be obedient before. Now we'll see if you can remain obedient and be obedient with all this distraction now in the land. You have, now you're going to have to prove to me, prove that you can be obedient. I want to see you actually rely on your dependence on me. And, and I think that's kind of true with us sometimes, too, in a lot of ways. God doesn't just instantly change every area of our lives when we become believers. He wants us to do our part. Now, there are some, don't get me wrong, there are some, possibly, uh, that maybe have some real issue with a particular sin or something. And when they first become believers, God just instantly takes that desire away from them. And that's wonderful. That's a miraculous deliverance. But for many, oftentimes, that's just not the case. God wants us to do our part, to turn, to follow him, to trust in him for deliverance from those things. And notice also, too, here, it's the generations of the children. They had been following and being obedient up and through Joshua and those of his generation. But it's this next generation of the children that, and it's so that they might be taught to know war. These children haven't known war yet. They haven't really known struggle yet. And he wants his people to be warriors. He wants future generations to know what it means to fight. Israel and this whole land that he's given them, it, it's a hostile environment. And it will be for the major part of their entire history. And if you look at the area today, what's going on? It's still a hostile environment. All of these pressures and all of these different kingdoms all around that's going to surround them all through the generations. They needed to be prepared. They needed to be a, a nation that knows how to protect itself. Of course, with God's help. And as long as they're being obedient, he would help them. We're going to see all through their history, the, the, just the position, the strategic position of where Israel is located and the successive world powers that will surround them throughout history that will present problems. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, Persia, Greece, all major world powers at one time or another that will present issues to Israel. So having a strong military capability was important and a necessity. And I think just like Israel, we as Christians can take something from that. There's going to be constant battles in your life with sin. No one likes to struggle. No one likes to battle, especially with our own sin. But sometimes that battle is good for us because it, it, it reminds us of our reliance on God, on Him to defeat And to be able to survive in this environment. 
So that's why he often will not completely eliminate those sinful things in our lives. He leaves them for us to conquer with him, with his strength, when we rely on him, when we're dependent on him. When we trust in him and we learn to live in him. But for Israel, for now, he's going to teach them this lesson. And it's going to happen over the course of many years through a whole series of cycles of remembering to trust him, turning away from him, being delivered. And so he left these nations to be there to test them. And who are some of those nations? Look at verse 3. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites, who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left, that he might test Israel by them, to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So again, they were left so that that God would know whether you're going to obey me or not. And he named all of these pagan people that were going to be stubbornly uh, a stumbling block for Israel, that, he had, that they had stayed in the land, these exact temptations. And it's good to know what your exact temptations are in your life. What is the sin that remains in your life? It's, it's good to name that, to know who that is and what, what that is when it comes to time for the battle. But the God, again, the God, the reason he didn't just completely eliminate them was to prove, was to test Israel, to prove their commitment to him. If they were obedient, then these other nations wouldn't hinder them. But if they were not obedient, he's going to turn them over to be oppressed by these nations. And we see right away, beginning right here in the next verse, that they were not completely obedient. And we see the consequences and we see the first of these cycles now. In verse 5, Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and they gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, they forgot the Lord their God and they served the Baals and the Asherahs. They took their daughters to be their wives. They gave their daughters to their sons. In other words, they assimilated right into the culture, right there with them. They made accommodations, right? They had this intermarriage thing going on with the nations. Now, we think today intermarriage and different nations and and What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it here in this picture is, is that God had specifically told them not to do that. God had specifically called them out to be a holy people to represent him. So they had, they, they had been given a specific um, requirement by God to remain pure and holy within the nation of Israel. Because what happens when, that, when you do that, you start mixing cultures and mixing these things, is one side or the other is going to draw the other to their, and, and that's what happened. They ended up forgetting the Lord, their God, and they started serving their gods because of their influence. And we can even look at that today. I mean, we're, we have, even as Christians, we have, and this was more of a spiritual thing, not necessarily a, it wasn't a, a nationality per se type thing. It's a spiritual thing. And we, we can look at this and, and look at the New Testament and scripture, and particularly in 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us to not be unequally yoked. Because those ungodly romances, that unequal, if you're unequally yoked, in other words, a Christian with some other religion, one of the two of you are going to pull the other one way or the other. And there's going to be influence. And that's the, the reason for that. 
that warning to not do that. And God had told them, don't do that. But they did. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 tells us, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has, was, has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer in an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. And walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Separate. He wanted them to be separate. Now let me make it clear. If you're already in one of these type of relationships or marriages today, This is not a command to leave. Thank God for grace. Because we live under that new covenant. And it makes it clear for a believer that we are to, we have a duty to stay. To cover the non-believer. As long as the non-believer is willing to stay. The challenge is, is for you to stay obedient to God. And not fall for the trap or the snare or be pulled away. It makes it that much more difficult now to deal with those issues in our lives. And we have to battle with those issues. You must not allow that non-believer to draw you away from God. To turn away and to start following other gods. But now for them back here in Judges in verse 8. He says, therefore, because they had done this, therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan, Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan, Rishathim, eight years. So God gave Israel just what they wanted. You want to go serve their gods? You want to be a part of that nation? Then go. You could serve under them. You don't want to serve me? Then you can go be bond or bondage to them, to that pagan king. You, they reaped exactly what they sowed, right? And, and interestingly, this name, Kushan Rishathim, it, it literally reads Kushan of double wickedness. These were a wicked people. And, and many people believe that wasn't really actually a, a, a real name. It was more of a title, right? It was more of a descriptive title to, to show or to ridicule or intimidate the other nations around him. It's like uh, just having a terrible name, a, a tyrant's name, showing that... that uh, how wicked they were. But in that day, in those times, the word Mesopotamia actually described this well-fertile, well-watered area in eastern Syria and northern Iraq. So this is where they've now been uh, given over to this king who, who has all this lush land. Go serve them. And they serve under the oppression for eight years. Many years before they eventually cry out. But they eventually do cry out. And when they cry out, look at verse 9. And when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered Kushandra, Rishathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathiam. So the land had rest for 40 years, then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So the first of the judges is raised up. After eight years of bondage, Israel finally cries out. They cry out and, and turn back to God for dependence on him. 
and he answers. How long does it take you sometimes to cry out? How long do you suffer in bondage under a particular sin or something going on in your life before you eventually turn back to God and say, oh God, please. I mean, oftentimes we have to exhaust, at least exhaust all of our human uh, trials to fix our own problems, right? I got to try to fix it myself first. It's only if I can't fix it and I've tried everything within my power, then I might cry out to God. God wants us in a relationship with him where we're crying out to him everything and everything and all the time. So they finally do, they cry out, and God raises up this deliverer, the first of what we call the judges. And he judged Israel. And he's this great hero that comes along and delivers them, defeats this king, pagan king. And uh, now he, we've seen his name before, right? He's the, uh, remember Caleb, the great hero Caleb? This is the the nephew or now son-in-law of Caleb who he gave his daughter to, a woman of faith. But regardless of who he is, what we see is that it was God. It says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. God raised him up. God gave him the power to do what he did. And we'll see that as a theme as we see. look at all these judges. The Holy Spirit empowered him for the job called, called him to. And he'll do the same for you if he calls you. He lived out this principle, this, this principle we see in, in Zechariah uh, chapter 4 that says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You see, it's not about your might, your power, or anything you have. It's about the Spirit of God working in your life that allows you to do that. He was empowered by the Spirit of the Lord, and he delivered Israel. This is a clear indication of the Holy Spirit working in the Old Testament for those that believe that the Holy Spirit wasn't around back then. But this is just the first cycle. Of course, we're going to see the cycle repeat. Look at verse 12. So the land rested for 40 years. They were oppressed for eight. He delivers them and they have 40 years now. And then, verse 12, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. You remember where Moab is on the east side of the Jordan? And so the children of Israel, after 40 years, they eventually had turned again and did evil in the sight of the Lord. He had brought deliverance through Othniel, and they eventually, though, they drifted away again from their dependence on God, from their obedience towards God. You see, having victory and having been delivered did not automatically guarantee that that would last forever. It's something that has to be maintained. It lasted at least while Othniel was alive, but then he dies, they turn away again, and eventually, so now they're going to be oppressed again. God will give them over. This time, by these three distinct groups, we see Moab, the east of the, the sea, east of the Jordan there, between the Arnon and the Zered, um, it was where uh, some 50 years before where Israel started their invasion, right? Ammon to the northeast of Moab was established about the same time as Israel there in uh, around the 13th century BC. And then the Amalekites, they were akin to the Edomites and um they're kind of a nomadic race, uh, nomads, if you will. And they, they had the considerable area there south of Judah. Um, and and it, it, many believe, and you could um, say that they were probably one of Israel's bitterest enemies. 
Um, we see that in Exodus and in Samuel. So once again, the children of Israel served these other nations. They served the king Eglon. They're brought into submission. They're brought into bondage. They suffered eight years of bondage before they cried out in the days of Othniel. They endeared another 18 years now under this king. 18 years before they'll cry out again. You see, sin always brings bondage. And it, and it comes to us deceptively. I, I like this analogy that uh, David Guzik uh, gives in his Enduring Word commentary. He, taught, he gives this analogy of fishing. You see, the fish never contemplates the bondage that he's going to suffer from the hook. He's just going after the bait. Right? The bait looks good. Tastes good. Give me that now. But then Satan, then, then once he takes that though, he's hooked. Satan, make, he snares us by making that bait look good. He makes that bait smell good and taste good and look good. But then once you bite into that hook, you're hooked. Of course, the appeal wears off after a time. And after 18 years at this point now, that appeal is going to wear off again. And they're once again going to cry out and cry out to God. In verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So once again, we see God's mercy. They cried out to God and God loved them. And because of his mercy, he's going to rescue them once again. Now, he's the one that allowed them or sent, you know, gave them over in the first place. But it's always to drive them to repentance, to show that they need him to be dependent on him. And he had every right to cast them off completely, but he has plans for them. And so he responds. This time he sends Ehud, a left-handed man. Interestingly enough, in that day and age, in the ancient world at that time, left-handed people were often forced to become right-handed people. Um, that, that It was looked upon as, as not desirable, right? Um, and so the fact that he made this left-handed man, this deliverer, this great leader, uh, was even more unusual the according to one of the commentaries out there, the description literally meant restricted as to his right hand. Um, it was regarded as a physical defect that he didn't have any use in his right hand. Anyway, but he uses this man as the next judge. Verse 16, now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. And now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back to the stone images that were at Gilgal. And he said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. So Ehud, he goes and he brings tribute from the Israelites. He's, he's trying to play up to the king, right? He's got a dagger hidden on his right hand side and, and he can't use his right hand. He's left handed. So he goes in though. And once they presented tribute, which was probably a whole bunch of servants and slaves that came with him to bring tribute would have been a whole bunch of stuff. Once that's presented, he sends those people away and he, he tells the king, he says, hey, I've got a secret message for you that I can only tell you. So send your people out of the room. And so he sends the people out of the room. That's just the two of them in the private chamber. 
He says, I have a message from God for you. So he rose from his seat. And then verse 21, then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and he thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. And then Ehud went out through the porch, and he shut the doors of the upper room behind him, and he locked them. And when he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he's probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. And so they waited till they were embarrassed, they were embarrassed and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore, they took the key and opened them. And there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sierra. So again, <coughs> he runs his dagger into him and kills him. He's going to deliver his people from out from under Eglon. He, he tells him, I have a message from God for you. And he kills him. A secret message. The message was, you oppress God's people, then you're going to get judged for it. I mean, F.B. Meyer gives some thoughts on, on it. He says, God's messages are often secret. God's messages must be received with reverence. God's messages leap out from unexpected quarters. And God's messages can be as sharp as a two-edged sword and cause death. The point was, God's word is true, and you oppress God's people, you will be judged for it. Spurgeon would put it this way. Um, he would say that a preacher should always present the word of God in a sense that he has a message from God. And this is a quote from him. He says, I'm afraid there are some ministers who hardly think that the gospel is intended to come personally home to the people. They talk as I read read of one the other day who said that when he preached to sinners, he did not like to look the congregation in the face for fear they should think he meant to be personal. So he looked up at the ventilator because there was no fear then of any individual catching his eye. Oh, that fear of man has been the ruin of many ministers. They never dared to preach right at the people. In other words, if it's a message from God, if it's God's word, you need to be able to preach it and teach it and look them right in the eye. This is God's word. And so Ehud brought that message to this king and he reached with his left hand. Most men fought with their right, so the king probably didn't even think nothing about it. It would have been unusual. And he struck him. Then we get the gruesome details. You know, his entrails came out. Um, we can, I mean, there's different interpretations of the wording that's used there. Basically, he, he hit him in the abdomen and stuff flowed out. Now, there are many who will think that find this whole passage troubling. The act of assassination is condoned. I can't say with certainty that this event in general was necessarily condoned or approved that, that God wanted to assassinate people. But God certainly raised Ehud up to be the, the leader to lead them out. Um, nevertheless, it, it was God who gave Ehud what he needed to be a judge to deliver his people from out from under this oppression. Then he was given time to escape. 
before his people were allowed to come in. He was attending to his needs, so they left him alone. Um, that literally means he was covering his feet. It was, it, some say it was a euphemism for he was relieving himself. Whatever the case may be, it gave Ehud time to escape before they eventually said, too much time's gone by, they got a key, they went in and they found him. And then the other thing we see in that whole passage is a couple of references at the very beginning and at, towards the end of that passage of the stone images. And those stone images at Gilgal, if you'll recall from earlier, is probably more than likely the actual stones that were set up by Joshua when they first went into the land, commemorating that miraculous crossing of the Jordan the first time. So it was a well-known landmark that would have been easy for them to uh, get a position on where they were at. And so, again, he delivered. And verse 27 says, And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of the Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So after he killed their king, he came back, he blew the trumpet, he rallied the troops, if you will, and said, follow me today, the Lord, the Lord has given over the Moabs to us, into our hand, delivered the enemies into your hand. He says, follow me, for the Lord has delivered. And they followed, and he became the, the next judge, the leader, Ehud. They had been oppressed for 18 years this time, and now they're going to see peace for 80 years. And so they came together. They came together under this great leader and followed him. And he pointed them back to God. Follow me for the Lord. You need to follow for the Lord has delivered. And like any good leader, though, he had to go first. He had to be out front. You can't expect followers to go anywhere that a leader has not already gone. And so he leads them back to God and they had rest for 80 years because of his cunning, because of his courage, because he was receptive when God called him. Now during this, this 400 year period or 350 year period of the judges, this 80 years will be the longest period of freedom at any one stretch. So it's a dramatic example of how in the Lord one man can make a difference. And God will call others and he will and, and he many times will call people to work with him, but but one man made a difference. And then we come to verse 31, and we come to the third judge. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath. Now Shamgar, not much in that first half of that verse right there. Shamgar is one of six individuals throughout the, the list of judges as we go through that's often called a minor judge. And it's not because he was minor possibly in any way. It, and and it's, it's really just because there's not, not much written about him. We just don't know. Yet the work he does for God was just as important as anyone else's or he wouldn't be listed to begin with. And the rest of that verse continues and gives us what his greatest accomplishment was. He says, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So we know that at some point Israel was under uh, oppression again by the Philistines, and Shamgar delivers them. 
And outside of this verse right here, that's about all we know about Shamgar. But he killed 600 men with an ox goad. Um, and and it, I don't know why we don't know more about him. I mean, it could be that his story was so well known that he didn't need to write it down. But 600 men, it's just an example, again, of someone serving God. It's serving God with whatever tools he's given. He simply used what God had put in his hand. In this case, an ox goad. It's a stick. It was probably about eight feet long, give or take. About, probably about five or six inches around on one end at least. The other end would have been chiseled, kind of like a, uh, to chisel dirt, scraping a plow clean. Um, it was used in the field to, behind the oxes that were plowing. And it was used to goad the oxes along as well as to clean the plows off. And in the hands of a, a, the right person, a strong man, it obviously could be a very dangerous instrument. And even more fatal than possibly a sword. Um, Clark tells us that in his commentary. But it also, what's important about this verse, many people say, well, it doesn't say that they did evil in sight, that they were oppressed by some these people first, and all these other things that we get from these other descriptive judges. So how do we know he was a judge and God raised him up? It says because he also delivered Israel. And that fits right in with the same theme of all the other judges. He was called upon by God to deliver them. And so the point is, is God can use anyone. He can use those people with the tools that he's already given them. It doesn't require anything special. This guy was probably a farmer working behind the ox and the plows when he was called upon by God to go now and deliver the people. He was just a laborer doing his job, but he took what God had given him and he did what God called him to do. Remember, like Moses, Moses it was a shepherd's staff. For David, it was a sling. You see, it doesn't matter what the tool was or who you were. David was a small guy of the brothers. It was about being willing to follow God and do what God called you to do with the tools God gave you. And the reason for that is because now who gets the glory? God gets all the glory. What tools has God given you to serve him? You see, he's not looking for some supernatural work on your part. He's not looking for anything really except willingness and obedience. Are you willing and are you being obedient to what he's called you to? Faithfulness. To take what he's given you and serve him. And that's what we see in this short little verse about Shamgar. Faithfulness to do what God called him to do, and then he delivers God's people. And that's just the first three of the prophets or the judges that we will see over the, the course of this study through this book. There are more to come. Next week, we're going to stop there tonight, and next week when we pick back up, we're going to pick up in chapter 4, we'll probably do chapter 4 and 5, and, and we're going to look at Deborah. You heard me right, Deborah, a female called to judge Israel. And so, um, join us, come back, we look forward to that study. But in each case we see tonight, we see this cycle. We're, we're 
have rest, we have peace, we're following God. But all of a sudden, when things are really good, they fall into a trap, a snare. And they turn and they do evil in the sight of the Lord. They do evil in the sight. It tells me that, not that anything can be hidden from God, right? Everything's in the sight of the Lord because the Lord can see everything. But that, that phrasing in the sight of the Lord tells me that they did it out in the open right in front of him because they didn't care. If he saw, they weren't even trying to hide it. And so he gave them up to be oppressed by those that he wanted to follow. They want to follow them, then I'll let them follow them. You see, he will never force his will on you. He wants you to follow him and be obedient to him, but he will never force you. And he didn't force them, and he allowed them to be tested by these outside forces. And they followed the outside gods, the other people, the other gods. And so he gave them up to that for a period in order to show them just how... And then, of course, they would repent and come back because after enough oppression, after a while, they figured out this is not the right way to go. And I miss God and I want to go back to God. And they would turn and so God would raise up a deliverer, this judge, this this super hero of the day to come and then deliver them. And you see, we get caught up in that cycle sometimes and we get caught up in, in wanting to follow these things and God, but God's already sent a deliverer for you and I as well. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for you to deliver you, to deliver you out from under that oppression, the oppression of sin. What a blessing that is. What a picture he's painting through this whole cycles, through all of these judges, through this book of what it means to be delivered, to, to, to turn to God, to be dependent on him. So I just thank God for his word. I thank you for being here for tonight and for this study. And so until we come back next week and we pick this up, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you once again, Lord, for this message and for your word. I pray, Lord, that as we go through this, that you would speak just directly into our hearts, Lord. Convict us about the things that we maybe are holding on to or the things that we're battling with where we need to just completely turn them over to you. And I just pray, Lord, that as we surrender our lives to you, that you would then just direct our path. We thank you now, Lord, because you have already delivered us. What a what a true blessing and a, a gift that just, Lord, is almost uncomprehendable. But we just thank you for your son, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you uh, just go with us through this week until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.